All right, cool. Again, today is just a really quick uh, introduction to probability. We're going to talk about some very basic concepts, and then I'll kind of at the end show you what, the, what directions we're going to go uh, towards the end of next, this week and early next week with, with probability. So first of all, I have a question for the whole group. What is, what is probability? What does this word mean? Anybody say something? Adrian? Chance? OK. Chance? Any other ideas? What's the chance something will happen out of 100%? Imad? Likelihood. likelihood? Right, so it sounds like chance and likelihood are coming up. Did, Kevin, did you have something? Study of uncertainty. Study of uncertainty. All right, cool. So I would say that there's two, two good answers to this question. One is a rather pragmatic answer that I think pragmatic Dan would appreciate, and it's a measure of the likelihood of an event, right? That's what we mean when we say, oh, the probability of this happening, we're talking about the likelihood or uh, the, the chance of this, of this occurring. Probability is an overloaded word, so it also means there's a theoretical answer, and it's a system, it's, a, it's a, actually called a measure theory, uh, and it's a formal system to quantify un uncertainty. Uncertainty was another word that came up. So it depends on the context what you're referring to, because if you're saying, oh, the probability of this occurring, you mean the, the, the pragmatic answer, the likelihood. But if you talk about probability theory, then you're talking about the second, uh, uh, the second one. And there are many, many different flavors of probability theory. We're just going to stick with the simple, what we call frequentist uh, version of it for the purpose of this week. And then we'll talk a little more about what's called Bayesian probability theory next week uh, when we get into some conditional probabilities. So what's it good for? Let's talk about that. I think it's always important to motivate why we're learning something before we deep, you know, take a deep dive into the theory of it. So um, I mean, really, everyday uh, real world problems have uncertainty in them all the time, right? What's the likelihood you're going to make it to school before 10 o'clock? Well, it depends on a lot of things, like whether you set your alarm the night before, and how much sleep you got, and whether you're able to wake up. And did you hop on your bike in time? Or did you get the bus? And was there a, a, a bus accident? Is there a traffic jam? Like, there's so many things outside of our control that are simply uncertain to us because we don't have knowledge of them uh, at, the, at the outset, right? Can somebody think of an idea of when, wh like, what industry or what real world problem beyond the scope of, you know, just like getting to school, uh, probability has an application to? What ideas do you have? Stock market, like finance. Trading. What else? Kevin? Say it again. OK, so looking at the distribution of minerals in the Earth's crust. Weather patterns. Weather. Dan, were you going to say something? Poker. Poker, right. Games, exactly. Games of chance. You not? Right, the chance a word should come up in a markout chain, right? Uh, well, that's, it's kind of a, it's a model of how language works, right? So I came up with a couple different distinct ideas. One is diagnosing medical problems, right? Uh, I'm diagnosing all sorts of problems. If you go to the auto mechanic, they're not sure what's going on with your car, even given all, if you tell them all the symptoms. They may have a, uh, a strong belief that you know, your muffler has a hole in it based on the sounds, or that your spark plugs are dirty or something like that. But they really will not know until they look and find a lot more information about what's going on inside and validate their hypothesis. Same is true when you go to the doctor and they're trying to diagnose your disease. Uh, no matter how many sophisticated tests they do, uh, blood tests, immun immunization things, just simply listening to your cough, they're getting more and more symptoms and information about you, but it's still a measure, like they're uncertain about what is wrong, what's going on with your body. Uh, my father had a terrible, uh, painful, sharp thing in his gut uh, one time for two days straight, and it was an unsolved mystery. No doctor, he went to three different doctors, and they could never figure out what it was, no matter how many x-rays they did. It was not appendicitis, but it seemed like it. It was on the wrong side. Unsolved mystery. Doesn't, uh, we never figured it out. <clears throat> uh, so basically, diagnosis is predicting the causes based on the symptoms. So you're given some information. You're trying to understand the underlying cause. And with Bayesian inference, which is uh, a subfield of machine learning, that uses a lot of statistical analysis, uh, what you're doing is using all the information to understand the underlying cause of these effects you're reading. So Bayesian analysis is actually used to do med medical diagnosis. Uh, risk assessment. Somebody mentioned finance. 
uh, definitely used a lot in, in stock trading and that sort of thing. You could also, you know, if you work for the EPA, you might do a lot of uh, quantitative risk analysis with probabilities about what's the likelihood that this Keystone pipeline is going to burst and like pour oil all over uh, the, you know, the, the, the Earth's crust, things like this. Um, what are, what's the likelihood someone's actually going to follow through on their promise uh, to maintain certain um, uh, you know, emission qu qualities? What's the likelihood that our seas will rise to a certain level by the year 2100? All of these things are based on uncertainty and models of how things move based on probabilistic inference. Another one is product reliability. So when you buy something uh, at the store in, in the United States, usually if it's some sort of consumer device, it has a lot of little stamps on the bottom that say CE and all these like European Union and the United States have like uh, basically put this device or this product through rigorous tests to make sure that it doesn't have too much uh, you know, toxic chemicals in it. It doesn't have an EMP that's being emitted. All of these things are to make sure that it's not hurting, hurting you with a, uh, with a certain uh, level of certainty, and also that it won't fail with a certain level of certainty. Uh, they do samples at factories when they're building products, and they, they'll maybe sample uh, 10 or 15 out of like 10,000 uh, items being built, uh, random samples in it, and that, that'll give them some level of confidence about how uh, high quality and working, how well uh, the, all the other products will work. They're not going to test every one, but if they take a large enough sample, they can have a decent confidence that 99% of the products that come out will work well, and they only have to deal with a certain number of returns to the store. Right? Any questions about applications or other ideas that I didn't think of at all? Cool. Um, OK, so really quick, I'll, I'll go over the rules of probability. We're going to go over these in, in more depth next week when we talk about uh, other uh, more deeper concepts like conditional probability, but I thought it was worth mentioning here for those of you who have never seen them before. So basically, we talk about uh, probability of events occurring. Events uh, are essentially a collection of possible states. There's this thing called a sample space of like all possible uh, worlds you could be in or futures that could unfold, and an event is a subset of those. It's some uh, you know, for an, an event, say you're dealing with um, cards. An event could be that you're dealt a royal flush, right? That's a very specific set of cards out of the deck, but there are actually multiple ways to do that. Just like a full house, there are many different ways to make a full house in the game of poker, and an event is full house, which is actually several different disjoint possible futures. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so we, we usually just label these with variables. Um, and in the probability theory that we're going to be talking about, it assumes exactly uh, the, these, these axioms. Uh, most of them are relatively simple. The first one is simply saying that all probabilities are between 0 and 1. Somebody mentioned percentage, uh, up to 100% earlier. It's so just another way to quantify it. 100% uh, is 1, 0% is 0, and anything in between, is, is a, including the endpoints, is a viable probability. It cannot possibly be outside of this range. So when somebody says, you know, you're doing 110% effort. Uh, that doesn't work in probability. You cannot have a 1.1 uh, prob probability value. Um, one means it's absolutely certain it's guaranteed to happen, which is why this other uh, uh, set of axioms uh, comes into play. If some event is definitely happening, it, like it's in progress, or you're absolutely certain it will happen in the future, it's considered to be true. And the probability of that is one, probability of some uh, event that can never possibly happen in the future or certainly has not happened in the time has passed uh, is zero. We call that false. And the last one is a little more complicated. Uh, we'll unwrap it more later, but uh, I th still think it's worth mentioning. Uh, if you're talking about uh, two different possible futures, like say uh, I'm playing poker and I want to uh, think about the possibility of getting a full house or a straight, what you can do is, if you want to quantify that in, a simpler, in simpler terms, you can break it down into two subcomponents, uh, three subcomponents. The first two are very intuitive. Well, it's like the, the probability of getting a full house plus the probability of getting a straight. And there's an extra term here. You have to subtract off something else, which is the probability of getting a full house and a straight, which in the game of poker is not possible unless you're playing many, many cards in your hand. Um, but there are other events. So you could have uh, three of a kind and full house, right? Those are compatible hands uh, that you could get together. 
So the reason why you want to subtract that term off is it's the intersection between the two sets. There is some uh, possible future, like three of a kind and full house, when you could get both of them, and you would be double counting if you considered, uh, if you did not subtract off this term. Any questions about that? We're not going to use this directly right, uh, right now, but uh, it'll come into play later and we'll uh, cover it again. Um, there's two types of probability in uh, Bayesian infrequentist inference. One is called discrete, discrete not as in hidden, but as in separate components. Um, the other is continuous. We're only going to talk about discrete for right now because we're not dealing with continuous mathematics like calculus. We're dealing with discrete structures like words or card games or that sort of a thing. So basically they occur in what we call countable sample spaces. Something that's uncountable is like the, the temperature uh, outside. Technically there's no way to precisely represent the exact temperature of the, of the weather. There's like uh, it's a, essentially a vector field of all these different um, uh, possible temperatures outside. But the weatherman, uh, weather person, like basically approximates that with some uh, effectively discrete value. They're going to say it's 76 degrees outside, right? Um, so we're, we can collapse continuous things down into, discre into uh, discrete structures to make them easier to deal with. And some things are more natural to be discrete, like a card game. Uh, there's no continuous values there. It's either you have this card or you don't, right? <clears throat> so a couple of uh, different types of examples are coin flipping, dice rolling, and that's dice of any size and shape, uh, cards, or even a uh, random walk. Suppose you went outside and somebody blindfolded you and they had you like, kind of walk forward and left and right. You could bumble around with a blindfold on, and that's called brownie in motion. It's a random walk through the world, and you can model it with discrete movements uh, in like different times, uh, discrete time steps. Any questions about that? So let's talk uh, about uniform distributions, which is basically the simplest possible probability distribution you can have. Uh, basically, there are a known number of uh, outcomes. It's a finite number. And they all happen with equal likelihood. So there's no reason why one would happen more than another. This is true when you're rolling a fair die. Um, and what you end up having is that uh, these n values, in the case of a, a six-sided uh, cubic die, you'll have six different possible outcomes, and they each have probability 1, 6, right? Uh, very straightforward. And a uh, die is a really good example of this, provided it's fair. You can also weight a die, and it changes it. It's no longer a uniform distribution. And you will get kicked out of lots of casinos, probably banned for life if you do this. Um, there are, I, I understand that there are 20-sided die that are fair. And there are other ones that look like they would be fair. But they're actually, if you carve the surface in a certain way, there will be more weight on one side of the die than the other. And technically, it's a little bit off. You want to be careful with that. So uniform distribution is really, really straightforward. Um, anytime you're, uh, you know, you see one thing, you're just as likely to see another. <clears throat> However, we're, uh, this is what we did in the, in the section um, called sample, uh, the, the random dictionary words, right? We just read this list of words and we picked one with equal probability for each of them. We're just picking a random index, right? <clears throat> but then we wanted to actually put a little bit of uh, logic and a little bit more intelligence into our language model, this like, kind of random word generator and come up with words that are more likely to be said, right? Much more likely to say the or the or desk or chair than uh, xylophone, right? Um, or sassafras. So this is where we basically um, had to consider word frequencies in some sample text that we were using, right? So there's two different questions you could ask here. One is, how many distinct words are in a text sample, right? When I say distinct, I mean unique, different words. So in uh, the example used in the, the tutorial, uh, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, how many distinct words are there? Five, right. Even though there's eight words in the sentence, uh, or in the book title in that case, the Dr. Seuss book title, there's only five words being used. Um, in fact, the, Dr. Seuss's other book, Green Eggs and Ham, was written based on a bet uh, someone bet him that he could not make a successful book that had f uh, 50 or fewer dif distinct words in it. And if you go and read Green Eggs and Ham, you'll find there are exactly 50 distinct words in this book. 
Turns out that 49 of them are all one syllable, so it's very, very, very simple for uh, young children to read. Uh, turns out it was a very successful children's book. <clears throat> However, um, different words come on different frequencies, right? Like in the title of the book, One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish, one occurs one out of eight, uh, just one time. Two occurs just one time. Red and blue each occur one time out of eight total words, whereas the word fish occurs four times, right? So it has a different frequency and therefore a different uh, probability of occurring if you were to try to sample from this set. So the important distinction here is that there's a difference between a, what we call in computational linguistics a token, which is a word showing up in text, and a type, which is a distinct word, right? <clears throat> so uh, there are four tokens of the word fish in that title, but there are five different types or distinct words. Does that make sense? This is just specific vocabulary we use to not confuse ourselves, because when you say word, it's ambiguous whether you mean token or type. You say, oh, look at that word. Well, do you mean fish like as a token that, it's, uh, uh, that has occurred this third time now in the sentence? Or do you mean fish a uh, type that occurs four times in that, in that title? So this, these will be good words to use if you're describing you know, sampling and that sort of thing with other people uh, to disambiguate what you're, what you're referring to. So. Uh, basically, how do we actually get this uh, distribution that we want that's non-uniform? Well, we need to like tally up or count the tokens in our sample text, right? So I've got the book title here, and then I made this chart to show exactly um, uh, what you should come up with. This is essentially the uh, histogram that you're building in the, um, I believe it's the second part, uh, no, the third part of the tutorial that you should have completed on Friday. And then this is the same histogram that we'll be sampling from today in order to actually generate words in a more uh, interesting way than uniform. And I went so far as to make sure blue is blue and red was red uh, because the Stroop test is very unkind to your brain. So um, let's just talk a little bit about code. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into this because I want to give it away for people who have not finished the stochastic sampling section today. Um, but here is some Python code. Um, hopefully you can read that from where you are. And sit and like, look, in this, look at this and think about it. And what type of distribution is this using to sample these words? The words at the top being blue, fish, one, red, two. We're choosing a random integer between zero and one less than the, the length of the array. So it's basically picking an index into this array is what it's doing. Raise your hand when you know what distribution this is using. And we can proceed when we have at least three quarters of the hands up. So we have a list of five words here. We're choosing a random integer between zero and four, which is gonna be an index into that array. And then we just grab that, the item at that index and return it. And each of these five uh, indices occurs with equal probability because that's what the rand int function does. So at this point, everyone should have an understanding of what this does. Somebody tell us. Adrian? Uniform, uniform right? It's uniform because we're not really considering how many times the word fish occurs. That fish is much more common of a word but it's being picked with equal probability as all the others, right? So essentially, the main, the main task for today, um, for the st stochastic sampling section, is to answer this question. How would you change this code to sample using the actual word frequencies? And there are many, many different ways to do it. Uh, we can talk about them at a high level, but I don't want to show you the code. <clears throat> so who has an idea on how to do this? So he says to, Abe says to make a dictionary that maps the word uh, types to their frequency and then to order that dictionary by most frequent to least frequent. And then how do you know how often to choose the most frequent word? Go by the indices. What do you mean by that? Put in a list as a tuple 
and then index through it in order. So what makes it more likely that you'll choose the first word in that list rather than the last word in the list, which is the... Right, right. the first one is the most common, but um, how are you choosing uh, the index to, to select a word? Just looping through it? So are, are you more likely to choose the first word than the second, or the first rather than the last? Right, so in that case, you're actually gonna, it's still going to be uniform uh, unless you do something else using the, the frequencies. Any other ideas? Mike? I like this. So, so, so you're like duplicating words in a new list. Uh, yeah, so that's perfect. Exactly. So that was one of the ideas I came up with. You duplicate the words in your, uh, freq based on the frequency, so you, make, you, you multiply them in some sense. You can actually use the multiplication operator in Python to do this with a list uh, in order to duplicate words. And then once you have this much longer list that has duplicate words in it, you can sample that uniformly and you'll get something with, you'll get this, these common words with much, more, uh, much higher probability. Does it make sense why that's true intuitively? So how long is this uh, list going to be after you expand it? Exactly, as, many, as long as the text you import it from. So what is it equivalent to? Right, it's equivalent to the sample text, but it's, it's a very different order, isn't it? Can you speak up? Right, well, it's, uh, you're using a uniform distribution to choose from this, right? So it would be equivalent to, say, using uniform to just picking a random word in the original text, right? Ignat? Um, I don't actually think the random standard library has something built in that's like one function call if you give it a histogram, but you can be clever in several different ways to make it two or three lines of code. Um, the first time I did this, I think it was 10 lines of code to make it work, or maybe more. Um, but you can, there's many, many different ways to do it. Did you have a question, Elio? So using the, uh, the frequency as a fraction based uh, is it a, a ratio? Yes. Yes. It's basically the probability, right? Yes. And then what are you using that to do? Well, how, do you, how are you using that value to pick randomly? I don't, I, I just... Right, right. It like intuitively makes sense, right? But this is like the, the challenge of programming is recognizing that we have to make our thoughts so explicit that a computer can understand what we mean. I think that is what is like challenging and fun about programming and debugging. To me, debugging is the realization that I have said it wrong. I, I've told the computer to do something different than what I meant. And it's, it's doing exactly what I told it to. Or if there's a bug somewhere else in someone else's code, it's doing exactly as that programmer told it to do. Iman? Right. That's another way to do it. Um, uh, one way to visualize what Iman has just said is if you tell me if I'm, if I'm interpreting your words correctly. Uh, imagine a number line from zero to one, and different words occupy different sections of this number line. So he was saying that maybe the word fish, since it occurs with 0.5 probability, or it's like half the words in that, uh, that title, it could occupy the space between 0.5 and one, right? And then the other words occupy smaller fractions of that number line, and you randomly choose a number somewhere on that number line between zero and one, which random.random .random gives you exactly that value, then you can find, like, you, you choose that place on the number line and you find out which bucket it has fallen into. Those buckets correspond to a word. Is that right? Great. Right. So you take the total number of tokens, which is the sum of the frequencies in your histogram. So you'll have, in the case of the one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, it's from one to eight. Right? And you choose a random number in that value, and you need to find at what, like you order your words somehow. You could do it alphabetically or whatever. And you accumulate the total number of uh, occurrences or tokens for all the words you've looked at so far. So pick a random number between one and eight. Two, okay. So maybe the first word in our, uh, our list is blue because it's, we're alphabetizing it. It's just arbitrary. Blue is gonna have uh, one token so you've only accumulated one, and your number is beyond that. So we need to keep going. We need to find this, uh, an, another word. The next one, I think, is fish. 
it, alphabetically speaking, and its total frequency is four, right? So we now accumulate five, because one for blue, four for fish. Five is now beyond the number two, so you could think of it as fish occupies the place on the number line from two to five, two, three, four, five, right? There's like four integers that it hits because there's four frequencies, and you picked a number that's in that range. So you would sample fish. So if you, basically, if you choose a number between two and five, you're gonna get fish. And that's exactly half of the numbers you can choose between one and eight. Does that make sense? The order is arbitrary, you just have to be consistent. That's all that matters. Iman? Is random enough? It's pseudo-random. Um, the only time that the randomness is not good enough is if you have this massive combinatorial problem where there are like billions and billions of possible outcomes, and we don't need to worry about that. You could devise a poker-like game that has so many hand combinations in it that you cannot possibly sample all of them. And so, uh, you know, certain hands could never actually be uh, uh, randomly arrived at in playing this game. But poker, there's, there's uh, small enough hands, which there's still a lot in poker, but it's small enough that any random number would get to it. So don't worry about how random it is. It's, it's random enough. There's also a concept in, in random numbers. If you wanted to repeat an experiment over and over again, you can do what's called seeding the random num number generator. If you just Google Python random seed, you'll find what function you need to call. And it's if you want to do repeatable experiments where you're generating the same sentence over and over again just to see how your model works. Uh, you can like essentially set a number to begin with and it'll start generating random numbers from a particular place, always the same one. Uh, but when you actually want new stuff, you don't want to seed it. Well, a seed is just a number you set. You say, start with 62 or whatever. Um, and the, the value of that is if you're running uh, test run, uh, like automated testing and you want it to t try the same data every time is like the primary reason you would use seeds. Any other questions, thoughts, discussion, hopes, dreams, feelings? I'm not going to tell you yet. We'll talk about it soon. These are two different ideas. Uh, consider the efficiency of each of them and try to implement both. The second one can be implemented in at least three different ways, two of which were mentioned here, one more that I'm thinking of. I mean, there are, it depends how you implement it, really. This third way could be done in a, a more or less efficient way. I will tell you that the first way is the least efficient, but also definitely the simplest. Like, you can do it in one or two lines of code. So it gets the job done, but as soon as you have a really big text that you're dealing with, you know, 100,000 words or a million words, this is going to be really slow. Because if you, the second way, the for loop is only go over, going over the number of types, and there are not a million words in the English dictionary. All right, that's it for today. I just want to give you a quick preview of where we're going with this. This is really just the starting point for probability. Um, soon we're going to talk about collocations, which is just like where when words appear next to each other um, in text. Uh, like, for example, the banana happens. People say that. The chair, the desk. Um, I'm specifically choosing a deter determiner and noun because they're very likely to occur next to each other. Um, but clock sandwich is really unlikely to happen, right? Because like, there, I cannot imagine a context for someone to ever say or write that. Um, it's possible. You can invent one. You can invent a context for almost anything. But it's unlikely. Um, an n-gram is simply the idea of you have n words together. So a bigram is a pair of words, like I said, clock sandwich or the desk. Um, a trigram is three. Uh, we're going to use those when we actually get a much larger corpus of text and start counting the collocations and the n-gram uh, frequencies. Just that's the direction we're going. Uh, in order to actually build the more uh, complex statistical model called a Markov chain or Markov model, we need to understand co conditional probability, which is kind of one step beyond, uh, but not that complicated. I, I feel confident that you can all understand it. Um, then we can actually build the Markov model, uh, which is this underlying thing, and a chain is essentially a run through this model, a stochastic uh, run through it. 
Then um, we can also, if you really want to uh, get into this, we could build a text classification system. Uh, we're doing generation now. But you can use a very similar model to classify text. So you could use several different corpora of different uh, students in this room, and then someone could generate a random sentence, and then you could try to figure out who generated it. Right? So you could classify which student's uh, model, uh, language model has actually spit this sentence out. You can use this for um, essay writing, that sort of thing, figuring out who has written something. There's uh, something called the Federalist Papers from a long, long time ago uh, in the colonial period of the United States when it was being formed. And there are hundreds of these very long articles describing kind of the ethos of the American dream and what the government ought to be like. And there were, I believe, four authors who wrote uh, the vast majority of these. But I think there were 14 that were unsigned and the author was unknown for over 200 years. And only in the last decade have uh, computational linguistics used statistical analysis with pretty sophisticated Markov models uh, and other techniques to actually figure out, uh, there are all these hypotheses in, over the past several hundred years about who wrote what, and they're actually able to figure out with statistical significance and be very, very confident who wrote which papers based on this model. So you can like classify uh, ancient texts if you wanted to. Right, right, yeah, he's saying it's a way to identify someone, right? Like you could, uh, it's, this is the same concept used in speech analysis for the sake of like Mission Impossible, you speak and you get into the secret room with the computer in it, right? Um, it really works uh, based on voice analysis. Uh, so classification is a cool problem. And we might talk at the end about something called smoothing and back off, which is basically because even though clock sandwich is really unlikely to occur, um, there are unlikely phrases that are grammatically correct and someone could say, but you may never encounter in a corpus. And you need to consider uh, those, th those sort of things because you might get a sentence that contains this like unseen bigram or trigram or whatever it is, and your model might say, there's no chance anyone ever wrote this. But in reality, there is some chance. Um, and back off is another thing we can do if you're uh, building, if you have a very, very large corpus, you can build a sophisticated Markov model with multiple different um, what they call it, uh, uh, orders, and you can kind of generate a sentence that's highly grammatical, and then you back your, you get into a, 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 a space in the language model that is unlikely to be in. You need to kind of back off and relax your model and say, oh, let's proceed with something more realistic um, that's, that's not so unlikely. Uh, there's kind of advanced topics towards the end. I just want to give you a preview that all of these things build on probability and especially conditional probability that we'll get to later. Um, so that's, that's it for today for the lecture.